here we will be discussing how to elevate the challenges of covid-19 in bronchoscopy so this forum is exclusively uh, for intervention pulmonology um, practicing physicians uh, to discuss various aspects of uh, difficulties what we face in a routine bronchoscopy we have uh, no financial disclosures this is a purely an educational web meeting sponsored by ashoda hospitals and the views expressed in this meeting are purely opinion of the experts and once again i would like to significantly point out this point saying that uh, most importantly none in the group recommend doing active bronchoscopies for uh, diagnosis of covid-19 as a primary diagnostic tool um we have expert panel from uh, west and the east throughout the world professor felix sir from uh, thorax clinic germany melvin tay he is the director from uh, singapore dr kyle hogarth michael pritchett from usa dr jesslyn pannu and uh, we have chinese colleagues dr yu chen and uh, dr jong malaysian rigid bronc expert dr jamal and dr michael abesi from italy dr eric from uh, harvard dr rakesh from uk and uh, we have uh, other guest faculty who will be acting as uh, uh, expert panel members uh, philip and um, ilia from russia dr ronald from uh, philippines and myself uh, dr harikishan dr nagarjuna and uh, dr vishweshan from india so the first topic will be on uh, elevating challenges of bronchoscopy in the covid season and this will be dealt by professor felix over to you professor yeah welcome everybody um, it's a pleasure to be uh, here active um, in another very nice panel with a lot of experts and focusing a little bit on uh, intervention pulmonology and i want to start with a couple of uh, points we have here debating how we should deal with bronchoscopy in the covid times just to give you an update this is germany actually we have nearly 160000 patients infected uh, we lost 6000 patients so at the moment we are quite lucky mortality rate is low in germany 2% and um, what we learned that when a patient is entering the icu level then the mortality even is raising in germany so we, when we have when we have to put the patient in icu putting them on ventilation support or on ecmo we have a high mortality rate and um, especially when the patient is entering icu there might be indications for bronchoscopy and the question is how we should handle that bronchoscopy or uh, just giving a little bit the feedback this was uh, 1896 when Kilian did the first one at that time we didn't know that something is living in the lungs or in in, in the throat so nobody cared about that yeah. no mask uh, no gloves and nothing and uh, over the time we got a lot of uh, different technologies and different indications so bronchoscopy is something we talking a lot we doing a lot it's our daily doing and it's our it, that is that what we have fun for um and we knowing that the lung diseases are increasing so even in the future we will have more and more uh work with the bronchoscope to do and when we normally talk to patients we talking about to patients and talking about the risk of bronchoscopy and i take that from an american publication we talking about chest pain pneumonia coughing bleeding and whatever in the past we never really saw the, talked a lot about what is the risk for the staff what is the risk of the procedure person when he is offering a bronchoscopy independently if we doing a flexible or doing rigid bronchoscopy nowadays it's a big big debate how and in whom we can perform bronchoscopy not harming ourselves not harming our team when we doing that um what we knowing for sure covid is uh, transmitted via large droplets or vomitis and with the bronchoscopy we have a aerosol generating procedure this is what we knowing and therefore we believing that there is a risk for us when we doing bronchoscopy but when we really want to prove that on an evidence based level there is no really evidence for that especially 
for the COVID. Uh, there is a little bit of evidence from, from, from or a, a case published from in the US. This was a patient who were, has been hospitalized for four days. During the four days, he underwent multiple procedures, including bronchoscopy. And uh, two days after discharging, he was tested for COVID and he was positive. So they analyzed all the people who have had contact with that person in the hospital, uh, have been 121 uh, hospital care persons, and 43, so 30% of that staff team developed symptoms within 14 days. Now, you can think about how many of those who developed symptoms have been developed a symptom to a COVID. Um, infection, and you see at the end, uh, only three persons really get an infection. Um, and that have been the persons who have been getting re reporting symptoms, but only three of them have had COVID. And when you look who received um, at which procedure they have been involved, that they have contact, you see it's back ventilation, it's non-invasive non ventilation, it's intubation. But none of the people who have been active in the Bronx suite have been infected. Yeah? For sure, a couple reported on symptoms, but this is the only case I found where, who, which really focus on COVID. So I went back in the literature and looked what is available about aerosol generating procedure, the risk of transmission in the time of SARS. There are five case control and five rest, retrospective, retrospective studies. And when you sum it up, you, there is an increase for intubation, for non-invasive ventilation, for tracheotomy, for mechanical ventilation, uh, for man, manual ventilation before mechanical ventilation, so back ventilation. But in all the papers, you do not find any increased risk for bronchoscopy. So at that time, I can stop my talk and say, there is no evidence that we have to use protection code in the Bronx suite. Yeah? But everybody is a little bit nervous, so we're doing it. And actually, we have uh, a couple of um, organizations who published their recommendations. These are the Americans, the Germans, the Spanish. Uh, so there are a couple of societies, um, the Chinese one. And I think everybody's in line that in the time of COVID-19, we should postpone elect elective procedure. But even when we're saying we should postpone elective procedure, what is a pro elective procedure? Is the diagnostic of cancer an elective procedure when the patient is asymptomatic? So there are a lot of questions regarding the term postpone an elective procedure, for sure. When we have to do a procedure, we should screen our patient. It's a little bit depending where you are and what are your capacities and what are your possibilities. Do you me measure only temperature or do, do you analyze the symptoms or even do you do a swab? This is a, a little bit depending where you are and what is the local situation for that. Um, what I think all everybody is in line that we should minimize the number of people in the room, that we should wear masks. But when you see the different uh, recommendations from different societies, they are completely rec different recommendations to the type of the mask. So some recommending FFP3, which is the highest level, some not. Uh, some using eye protection, some using eye safety glasses, the other full. Ma full face mask. Uh, there are different recommendations regarding anesthesia. Uh, most of us recommending disposable scopes, but when you have a lymph node and when you want to do an EBUS procedure, there is no disposable scope. So there are also some questions regarding the type of scope depending to the procedure you, you want or you have to do. And uh, last not least, um, uh, sorry, this was the wrong, this the wrong way. Um, there is also not really a, an agreement in how to 
handle everything after the room. Um, a scope disinfection, everybody's writing standard high level, but there is no definition of standard high level. So it's also completely different to the type of disinfection uh, route you have established in your in your endo suites. And when you go for room disinfection, there is also a wide variation of recommendations from different societies how you should handle the room after a procedure. Um, just uh, Feng Ming Luo just published uh, a recommendation for bronchoscopy and respiration, and he uh, you, uh, showed um, one checklist. Uh, he is uh, recommending the checklist come from the Royal Brompton Hospital. Uh, for sure, I think you have to go to special points when you prepare um, a procedure in COVID times, and it, for sure it makes sense to be best prepared. So we would recommend checklists for the procedure to be sure that it really everything is there and not too much is there. So summarizing a little bit uh, the intro of the whole evening, morning or night, wherever you are in the world. Uh, actually, nobody knows what's coming next. Germany is when through the first wave, you only see limited number of new cases, but nobody knows when the second wave is coming and if a second wave is, is coming. Regarding the bronchoscopy, what we're doing and how we're performing procedures, the evidence is not really there. It's more or less an, an experience-driven behavior. And that behavior depends totally on the local situation. Do you have easy access to swap results? Do you don't have that? How many uh, masks you have in your stock? Um, which quality you have? But there are a lot of situations which, which are depending. And I think in the next hour, in the next one and a half hour, we, we will can stress a lot of those points and we, we can discuss a lot of points. Uh, actually, what we want to do, we want to uh, be sure that we offer that what we have to do to offer to our patient from the wrong side. But on the other, other hand, we, we are responsible for our team. We are responsible for our health. So therefore, we also have to balance that we don't bring us in a risk when we're doing procedures in the COVID time. So that was my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that talk. Uh, we have a question and answer session by Jessine and uh, Dr. Um, Melvin. Uh, we'll take up questions after the first session is over. Mm -hmm. Then we'll be moving to the second topic is by our Chinese colleagues. They'll be sharing their experiences of uh, bronchoscopy in COVID-19 patients. So this talk is by Professor Zong. Uh, over to you, Dr. Zong. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, I think you have to unmute your your mic. We cannot hear you. We can, we can see your screen, but we cannot hear you. Or I cannot hear you. I can't hear anything either. Uh, Joel, can you help uh, Dr. Zong to open up his uh, mic? Joel is checking uh, with that. Okay.
Uh, I think uh, we. Uh, we still can, we still cannot hear him. Maybe maybe we we moving on to the next talk and then we yeah. coming back to him. That's better. Uh, the next lecture is by Dr. Yu Chen from uh, Gonzo. He'll be talking on how to run IP clinics during COVID nineteen. Hello, everyone. Good. Good evening. Could you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Dr. Hurst. It's good to see you and good to see everyone. Um, I apologize for the uh, Chinese network. Maybe the speed was too slow. I may close my um, video, then it is probably better than you can You can see me better. Okay. Oh, you can hear me better. And thank you for taking your time. Um, okay. okay, I will keep talking. Um, the topic for me is running IP clinic during the COVID-19 season um, with my Gonzo experience. This is what we've done uh, for the last three months from January to March. We totally uh, finished 192 cases for bronchoscopy. That included um, 71 BL, and the biopsy is 61, and the uh, endobronchial biopsy is 38. For the branch is 32, and EBUS TBNA and EBUS TBLV is 32 to 21. And for the treatments, laser, EC snare, or and the APC is 18. Uh, the balloon dilation is 15. And stents, we place five metallic stents and the three silicon stents and one case for foreign body removal. As we've done for, um, there's not a small numbers uh, for the last three months. Um, for, uh, we do good people protections and we don't have any one cases, uh, in fact, from COVID-19. So today I want to talk about the experience for the emergent bronchoscopy during the ep epidemic of COVID-19. The background for uh, this problem, I think everyone now can feel it um, uh, very um, indeed. So uh, I want to say bronchoscopy is one of a important diagnostic and treatment uh, method for the um, uh, in respiratory disease. So uh, during the uh, hard time for us, we didn't stop any one day. So we keep on doing our work from January to March. Before the procedure, I think we should know first uh, we need to finish the COVID-19 screening uh, as the body temperature and the history where the, the patient have been for the, uh, for the last 14 days and the RT-PCR for the text and track CT in the recent three days is very important. So everything is negative, then we can move on to the procedure. This is what we have to protect our cell. Uh, for in China, it is the grade three personal pr protection. The, 19, the N95 mask was necessary and ice goggles uh, and guns. Uh, the operator, uh, usually we will uh, suggest stands on the size of the patient's head so that you, you won't face, uh, face to face with the patient and keep an, a distance uh, and avoiding face directly to the patient. And 
what kind of patients for the uh, in this time should be as an emergent bronchoscopy? Um, as we have to saving the life for the patient, uh, like with the severe acute airway obstructions, um, with the stenosis, no matter if it's benign disease or malignancy, and sputum plugs causing retention and um, hemoptysis. And with the patient who have progress, progressive dyspnea and severe hypopnea and carbon dioxide retention. And that kind of patient, they need an emergent bronchoscopy. Then we can't wait. If the patient's status was stable, then we can wait longer. And what kind of preparation we have to do before that? Uh, like operating room, we insist in the negative pressure or uh, isolation rooms. Um, and the and the sedation are recommended to perform during the operation of the bronchoscopy. And that will prevent the patient from coughing and vomiting. Less cough will be um, more safe. And uh, elimate or laryngeal mask infection uh, or from the indo tracheal intubation um, should be considered if necessary because it will be more safe. Um, for the diagnostic bronchoscopy, there is some simple suggestion for, from me. First, only if necessary, we, uh, we would suggest to do bronchoscopy. If the patient can have other options like build them and other easy ways to get uh, the answer from the um, or from infection or malignancy, then it is not necessary for bronchoscopy. So only necessary. And transnasal and keep the patient's mask on. Uh, when I was an IP fellow in United States in Detroit, usually we have uh, we drive the scope not from nasal because it's so hard it, and, and it is uncomfortable. And sometimes may, it may cause him. But in this time, uh, we will suggest drive the scope causing the nasal and keep the patient have the mask on like, like this. We can see from the, um, from the bottom left picture, we can see the patients, uh, we have the mask on and prevent the patient coughing and causing the uh, mask. And if for a uh, text and BAL, if, if enough, and this is not necessary for biopsy, only if the patient, the disease was considered to be a malignancy, then we will do a biopsy. And if for treatments, for operations, and I would suggest for the, some uh, pieces of suggestion. Uh, deep sedation or general sedation will be suggested. And intubation is much better than rigid bronch. Usually for the, uh, we will do rigid bronch as it is so quick and very efficiency for some kind of um, tracheal stenosis and obstructions. But in this time, uh, rigid bronchoscopy, bronchoscopy uh, in the procedure, we will usually need to open the airway so uh, it's not safe. Uh, instead, intubation uh, with the flexible bronchoscopy, if it can be done, then we will uh, uh, choose it as the first choice. And the third is no jet ventilation uh, because the jet ventilation is causing a very fast airflow. Uh, any else for me, I would think um, a cup of coffee and have a good rest and uh, 
schedule the procedure better when it will be earlier. So because with the grade three protection, we have every gauze on, we have ice goggle for a long time, usually more than three hours, everything I'm almost done. So um, there's uh, some uh, small suggestion for this. Okay, thanks a lot. Great experience. Uh, I think we will discuss that later. Now, uh, do we know if we can go back to our other Chinese colleague? Uh, was that technical problem solved? Uh, professor, we'll take the call, uh, talk in the last and then we'll okay. move to the next lecture by Dr. Mike. Okay, then we will move on with Michael uh, giving us the guideline review. Michael, what's up? Hey there, Felix, how are you? Uh, let's make sure everybody can see my screen and hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Fantastic. All right, um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, the guidelines. And um, as Dr. Hearth pointed out, there's a lot of uh, guidelines that have been put out, some more thorough than others, some more focused on outpatient, some more focused on inpatient. Um, I actually think that there's um, a lot of homogeneity to the guidelines and, and there's a lot of similarities. There are certainly minor differences. The problem with guidelines when they're put out this early um, is that we're really just guessing. Uh, we're not really sure about a lot of things. We're using data from previous outbreaks like SARS, uh, which are very important uh, precedents to use. Um, so we'll go through some of these and, and obviously, uh, you know, the importance of this. So, you know, why are we considering this in patients uh, that have this? You've seen this data, no doubt, from the Journal of American Medical Association saying that your positive predictive value from a BAL specimen in patients with known or suspected uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, is much higher. You see that at 93% uh, compared to uh, the typical nasal swabs or pharyngeal swabs, uh, nasal swabs being at, at 63%. Sputum samples, which not a lot of these patients have active sputum when they first come in. And a lot of times if they do, we use that to rule out some other co-infections um, possibly doing PCR uh, on those sputum specimens for a wide variety of organisms. Um, so what we don't want to happen is everybody to think, oh, well, BAL is 93% and, and let's just um, bronch everybody because we'll have a higher diagnostic yield. And, um, you know, as was pointed out at the very beginning in the introduction, uh, that's something that we want to try to avoid. We're trying to base this as much on science as we possibly can. Um, so uh, this is a graphic from New England Journal really just showing you um, the particle size uh, based on uh, where these uh, particles are coming from. So the upper respiratory tract uh, are typically greater than one micron. The lower respiratory tract we know is, are, is much smaller, which tends to aerosolize. Um, and then that creates infected fomites and, and things like that. So some of the early guidance that came out was from the World Health Organization, uh, specifically directed towards aerosol generating procedures, which bronchoscopy certainly is. Um, other uh, aerosol generating procedures, as you know, are intubation. Um, and there are other aerosol generating procedures that people don't necessarily think about. Specifically, there's some GI guidance when they're doing upper endoscopies with conscious sedation, there may be some coughing involved. Uh, however, obviously they should not be uh, going into uh, the patient's trachea. Um, so you see that the type of PPE here that's re recommended is certainly at least an N95 or FFP2 as it's referred to. Uh, in Europe. Those two uh, are essentially the same. The N95 is the US uh, standard based on the NIOSH uh, certifications by the CDC, uh, and that's equivalent to an FFP2. Uh, certainly there are N99 and N100 masks, which are equivalent to an FFP3. And additionally, uh, you're recommended to have gowns, glove, eye protection, um, 
and an apron. Obviously, the reason for this uh, is that during an aerosol generating procedure, um, those viral particles that are aerosolized will get on your scrubs, on your jacket, on your arms, in your hair, on your face. And as we've seen, proper donning and doffing uh, is incredibly important. Um, you know, we can look back to the Ebola outbreak uh, and see that, you know, 30% of Ebola infections in healthcare workers have been from improper doffing uh, of their uh, PPE. So that's obviously very important as well. We all know the issue. We've seen this um, uh, visualization on the left from the New England Journal of a simulated cough um, in a patient uh, that has SARS. And then the various masks that we see there ranging from a simple surgical mask to various N95 models to uh, a PAPR. The importance of this can't be you know, understated. We see that now doctors and nurses um, are dying from this, particularly in Italy, there's over 150 doctors that have died uh, from coronavirus. Uh, the exact reasons for this are unclear. We don't have anything yet that can tie that specifically to aerosol generating procedures or bronchoscopies and things like that. What I can tell you uh, from talking with colleagues in, in Italy is that they are being asked quite often uh, to do bronchoscopies on these patients specifically to get a diagnosis of COVID-19. So in my conversations with them, it's become fairly standard that if they have two negative nasopharyngeal swabs on PCR, that they're now being asked to do uh, bronchoscopy for BAL. And some of them are quite uncomfortable with that, uh, even with all the right protections. Um, and again, uh, given the outbreak that they have there, they may not have uh, some of the proper uh, PPE to do these procedures. They may not have the proper uh, negative pressure rooms to do these procedures in due to the fact that it has overwhelmed uh, the system in general. So uh, again, more guidance from the World Health Organization, which has said, again, this is not recommending, but they have said that, you know, we recommend that you collect specimens from an upper respiratory tract source and where clinical suspicion remains. And if those are negative, uh, you can consider lower respiratory tract uh, cultures. Ideally, if these patients are intubated, we can get this from either a mini BAL or a tracheal aspirate, um, it leaving bronchialveolar lavage uh, as a last ditch option. Uh, and again, in hospitalized patients with confirmed COVID-19, uh, doing repeat testing uh, to demonstrate viral clearance this can be done, but what we've seen is we don't know the value of this. We've seen patients continue to shed virus out to 40 days and beyond, uh, and we don't know what that means. We've seen patients test positive on PCR, then convert to negative, and then positive again. Uh, and then certainly we have the antibody testing that we can talk about uh, a little bit later uh, in some of the pro and con debate as to the accuracy of this and what exactly does having IgG antibodies really mean. Um, so there are uh, a lot of societal guidelines and statements uh, that have been put out. Um, certainly AABIP put out a statement early and they updated it on March 19th. And we'll go through that, the WHO, which we've talked about. There's the Chinese uh, statement through the Handbook of COVID-19 Prevention. Uh, the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy uh, put out a, a peer-reviewed uh, evidence-based uh, guideline. And then you saw uh, as has already been presented by Dr. Hirth, um, Dr. Lentz from Vanderbilt and Dr. Henri Colt uh, have put out a summary of societal guidelines that was, play, that was published before the publication of the SAB guidelines. So those are not included there. Um, if we look at the AABIP statement uh, that they put out, uh, again, basically wearing the right PPE. And I think that this does highlight an important point is that your program has to be guided based on the degree of community transmission or community spread. There are some communities that have relatively low spread, whereas there's areas like New York City uh, where you have to assume everybody's positive until proven otherwise. Um, and so there are some recommendations there uh, for inpatient or outpatient bronchoscopy to use essentially universal precautions. We got to know the terms universal precautions uh, during the AIDS epidemic and so we've just said, look, uh, 
assume that everyone is positive. And for right now, for bronchoscopy, uh, we need to do the same uh, with a different set of universal precautions. Uh, they do recognize again that uh, this is an aerosol generating procedure and that there's increased risk uh, despite the lack of obvious evidence uh, as mentioned earlier uh, by Dr. Hirth. Uh, for outpatient bronchoscopy considerations, again, kind of a stepwise uh, fashion and most of the guidelines have, have stuck with this uh, to one degree or another, basically separating what is an emergent bronchoscopy, whether your stent has migrated or you have massive hemoptysis that can't be controlled with um, uh, bronchial artery embolization or another method um, if the patients have symptomatic tracheal stenosis or obstruction. Um, then we have the urgent bronchoscopy. There's really no other categories, you know, significant categories or subcategories in here. Uh, but obviously lung cancer is the biggest concern that we have here. And we know that lung cancer doesn't care about COVID-19. Uh, and so the American College of Surgeons also put out some guidelines suggesting some timelines uh, and the size of the lesions. If for example, a lesion is less than two centimeters, maybe delay that if they don't have obvious adenopathy. And to one degree or another, we're going to start seeing relaxation of these guidelines. We already are. Um, in hospitals where there's preoperative testing, and you'll hear about that a little bit later. So each individual location is going to have to determine at what point they start relaxing on some of these things and doing more of these semi-urgent bronchoscopies. We're very uh, frequently asked to do uh, navigation and robotic bronchoscopy with cone beam CT on one centimeter lesions. And over the last month, we've pushed those off. Um, we've temporarily pushed them off a month and then we reevaluate everything and see where our community spread is at, uh, where the lesions are at, where the patients are at, importantly, as well. If you look at the British Thoracic Society guidelines, again, these are recommendations specifically for outpatient bronchoscopy, and they really separate them into non-malignant indications, in which case we try to postpone patients with sarcoidosis or MAI, uh, or maybe interstitial lung disease and things like that versus a malignant diagnosis. Um, again, you can probably say that there are some non-malignant indications uh, that should be considered uh, more urgent or semi-urgent, and we will mention some of those uh, in the future. Again, assessing a patient's risk of whether they're low risk for COVID-19 or whether they're confirmed or suspected is often difficult, as we know, with significant asymptomatic spread uh, and patients uh, that are testing positive. Recently talked to a colleague at Cleveland Clinic uh, who's now doing rapid in-house PCR testing for all of their elective bronchoscopies. Out of the first 16 patients that they've tested, four of them have been positive uh, with no symptoms at all and therefore their cases were canceled. So again, assessing risk categories uh, may be different uh, but still necessary in terms of screening and asking about symptoms and travel and contacts and measuring temperatures uh, and things like that. Um, all right, so, uh, and then again, uh, Dr. Lentz and Dr. Colt's uh, summary commentary that was published in Respirology, uh, which is summarizing a variety of guidelines that are out there that are Chinese, Argentinian, uh, AABIP, uh, Spanish guidelines, as well as German guidelines. Um, in general, and you've already seen these earlier uh, during Dr. Hurst's presentation, again, there's a lot of commonality here, which is postpone elective procedures that you feel comfortable, screen everybody in general uh, for temperature and travel. A lot of these guidelines were written in March where travel was still considered something that was bringing this in. Now there really is no travel for the most part. So again, some of these guidelines have to be fluid uh, and change with the times. Uh, there is a general consensus that if possible, these should be done in a negative pressure room, uh, although that's not universal. Um, uh, the use of at least an N95, if not higher, uh, whether it's an N100 or a PAPR or FP FFP3 is universally recommended, but an N95 is the absolute minimum. Uh, there are some societal guidelines and SAB is one of those that we'll get into, uh, which was addressing the need uh, based on lack of N95 masks and how to safely reuse these uh, with some guidance that's been protected. We all agree that there needs to be some eye protection, whether it's a face shield or goggles uh, or perhaps both. Um, 
again, gown, gloves. Um, interestingly, only the Chinese uh, have recommended uh, wearing a cap uh, in their guidelines. We mentioned that and SAB guidelines as well for the reasons as mentioned before. Um, Dr. Hirth and myself don't really have to worry about that. We can just wipe down our heads after our procedures. Um, but, uh, but other people that, uh, that uh, still have hair, uh, that's easy for um, these aerosolized particles to get into and simply running your fingers through your hair and touching your face after the procedure can certainly result in cross-contamination and infection. Uh, and uh, multiple statements have mentioned avoiding uh, rigid bronchoscopy and, and jet ventilation. Uh, again, getting into a little bit more details, this is specifically with known or suspected COVID-19. And again, we wanna use the maximum amount of protections possible uh, for these patients. And again, you see a lot of commonality here with negative pressure rooms, at least N95, if not PAPR and FFP3. There's really not a lot of data that shows that an N95 or FFP2 uh, is less uh, adequate than FFP3, uh, at least uh, with this. Again, avoiding use of atomized lidocaine. Certainly there's a lot of data out recently that suggests this may not be that beneficial, but uh, it is a concern because I've done these uh, procedures relatively recently under uh, conscious sedation and these patients do tend to cough a lot uh, as you've seen. Um, all right, uh, and again, the summary of all of these basically is what I've just said, and I'll just leave this up here. You can take a screenshot uh, or, or do whatever you want. I won't dwell on this uh, too long. Uh, again, what has been mentioned before about the disinfection of the scopes, we'll get into a little bit more with the SAP guidelines. Um, for non-COVID patients, there's no consensus or recommendations. For COVID patients, there seems to have been, uh, again, a recommendation for high-level disinfectant, which there is a, uh, an established protocol for. We know that high-level disinfectant is adequate uh, for virus, uh, and that would include this virus as well. Uh, however, keep in mind, um, that high level disinfectant uh, and, and sterilization is really only going to work if there's no internal scope damage. We've seen previously that if you have internal scope damage, if there's a leak detected, things like that, then your high level disinfectant may not be adequate. So as long as you're following all the right protocols, um, there isn't specifically anything that should differ um, in terms of sterility of this device. Uh, in mid-April, the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy put out their evidence-based consensus statement and guidelines, um, and that was published in the Journal of Thoracic Disease Online. Um, we uh, did this in an evidence-based fashion and specifically made recommendations based on the level of evidence. Obviously, during a time like this where we're rushing to get guidelines and information out and when there isn't a lot of information, most of these recommendations may be somewhat strong, but the evidence quality may be low to moderate. Um, and so, uh, but we still wanted to apply all of these uh, to each of these. And I'm not gonna put all of these up there. You can read the guidelines here. Uh, but again, you'll see a lot of these end up being 1C, which is a strong recommendation, but a relatively weak level of evidence uh, using some limited SARS data, specifically from uh, China, where a lot of the early data obviously came out from, as well as extrapolating from SARS uh, and, uh, and infections like that. Uh, again, here's our categorization between non-COVID suspected and suspected. Again, those lines are becoming blurred uh, as, as we go on. But again, you'll see some consensus here uh, with uh, other guidelines in terms of N95 as a minimum. Now, when this first came out, we um, were really uh, still, some people were using regular masks uh, or they did not have N95s. And if this was considered a low risk procedure in a non-COVID-19 suspected patient, that's something that could be considered. Uh, again, with more uh, community spread, we're seeing less use of this and really wanting everybody to wear a minimum of an N95. Uh, we do suspect that a PAPR offers a higher level of, uh, of protection. Uh, so some, expert, some excerpts here, as you've seen with other guidelines, uh, again, the clinical benefit of using bronchoscopy just to confirm a diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 or to detect co-infection 
really has to be weighed carefully against the risk of bronchoscopy in propagating infection, specifically to oneself and to the staff of the hospital. Um, in certain areas, such as Italy uh, or certain regions like New York City, uh, that may be an inappropriate risk. If you take out two respiratory therapists and a pulmonary critical care doctor by doing a procedure, uh, then you have much less resources to treat those patients in your environment. And so, again, everything has to be done based on local factors uh, and individual factors to each patient. As with any patient with severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, bronchoscopy can precipitate a further decompensation and really needs to be considered carefully on an individual basis. From an outpatient standpoint, the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy decided to separate these groups uh, into a few more categories than you had seen previously. Uh, and we look at emergent and then urgent, acute, subacute, um, uh, including routine airway stent surveillance, um, and then essentially purely elective procedures like bronchothermoplasty, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, a BAL to look for MAI, uh, and uh, elective trig changes and things like that. Um, some of the larger centers do have to consider issues with transplant patients, patients with neutropenic fever and infiltrates that don't have a clinical diagnosis or lack of improvement with empiric therapy. Uh, and again, we consider um, lung nodules and masses with potentially early stage resectable patients relatively acute. Uh, we know that delaying those patients' care can increase the risk of them being upstaged. So again, this all needs to be considered based on local factors. So why would we wanna do a bronchoscopy in a patient that has suspected or known COVID-19? Uh, again, if you're doing additional testing uh, for these patients, uh, and you've been negative thus far in your oropharyngeal swabbing to evaluate for an alternative infection or co-infection. Uh, if you have a complication that you need to evaluate um, to consider concurrent diagnosis evaluation. Uh, there have been some reports of the need for therapeutic aspiration. There's been mixed reports. Many people say that these patients have no secretions whatsoever. Other people have said that there's a decent amount of secretions and some of them can be incredibly thick and tenacious and can result in uh, poor oxygenation and ventilation and a therapeutic bronchoscopy may be necessary if other non-invasive methods uh, have failed and we recognize the need for that. And then additionally, a new uh, recommendation uh, is going to be for uh, percutaneous tracheostomy. Uh, the SAB guidelines do specifically make recommendations, uh, actually detailed recommendations that did not include them in this, um, but they are in the paper that are specific to uh, tracheostomy uh, and uh, percutaneous tracheostomy in these patients. So we've talked a little bit before about choosing your weapons. Some other societies have come out and very clearly uh, said that you should only do this with a disposable scope. Again, we think that that's quite easy to say as the availability of these scopes is not universal. Additionally, it depends on your level of comfort. If a, if a physician has never used a disposable scope, uh, is very comfortable with their traditional bronchoscope, then depending on the procedures, they may have more comfort with their traditional scope and the comfort of that uh, provider um, and the expertise with which they can use that uh, is important. There is no doubt, however, that, uh, you know, for example, the AMBU scope in panel A here requires a lot less equipment that needs to be cleaned and disinfected afterwards. It requires less providers in the room to plug stuff in. Uh, and you may be able to even do this with only one other provider. So again, the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy stopped short of saying you should absolutely use a disposable scope. It really depends on local factors and what you're comfortable with and the indication for the bronchoscopy and things like that. We certainly recommend the ease of use and less concerns about cross-contamination. However, again, if you can guarantee that your high-level disinfectant or gas sterilization is adequate and that there's no damage to the scope, we cannot say that a standard bronchoscope uh, is at increased risk of transferring infection. Uh, but again, there is a lot of equipment that you need to wipe down and then move out of the room and wipe down again. Uh, so it is a little bit more work. Uh, and then the most recently, the International Pulmonologist Consensus on COVID-19 
uh, led by Dr. Joseph in India, who is on this call and can speak to this a little bit more. Uh, again, this was a wide ranging consensus statement uh, on care of patients and respiratory failure and, and everything else, but there is some information on bronchoscopy, again, which is very much in line with other uh, guidelines uh, that we've already seen, which is again, there can be some benefits, but there are definitely some risks. And specifically, there are some recommendations, again, which are very much in line with all the other guidelines. But the key point, again, still is that bronchoscopy by itself should not be done for the sole purpose of ruling in COVID-19 and risk of transmission and infections to others is extremely high through aerosols. So again, in the end, the common themes on an inpatient side of all of these guidelines is to avoid bronchoscopy if it's possible in patients with known or suspected COVID-19. If it is necessary to perform bronchoscopy, take all necessary precautions. I don't think that you can say that any precaution is too ridiculous at this point uh, because your safety um, and the safety of your staff is quite important. So maximum PPE with at least an N95 or FFP2, you can certainly consider FFP3 and a PAPR in addition to gowns, glove, face shield, eye protection. And again, we recommend a head cover. Staffing and perioperative uh, considerations, uh, as minimal as necessary personnel and the most experienced personnel necessary as well. And that's something that we've mentioned specifically in the SAB guidelines is if you're doing a percutaneous tracheostomy, if you're doing a bronchoscopy on these patients, this is not a chance for a med student or a resident to get their first shot or even um, you know, a, a first year fellow. This is something that should be done by the most experienced uh, people there in general. Uh, certainly your IP fellows and things like that uh, may need to be involved in this as well. Doing these in a negative pressure room is important. Very strict donning and doffing protocols um, as is being done in the ICU care of these patients. Again, we talked about high level disinfection versus gas sterilization versus using a disposable scope and local factors should dictate that. On the outpatient side, Again, delay non-essential cases, but that should be based on your degree of community spread and based on your hospital's ability to handle those patients. Um, all patients should be screened with temperature check, exposure history. Should we be doing perioperative or preoperative COVID-19 testing, whether that's rapid in-house PCR testing or antibody testing, there's gonna be a great pro and con debate to this a little bit later with Dr. Hogarth and Dr. Folk. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. Again, maximum PPE for now. The question's going to be, at what point can we go back to doing things the way that we used to? And a lot of that is going to be based on epidemiologic study, widespread antibody testing. Um, but for now, maximum PPE for outpatients, uh, even if they aren't high risk. Uh, staffing considerations, again, minimum necessary personnel, negative pressure room, still needs strict donning and doffing, and the same high level disinfection, gas sterilization, and use of disposable scopes. So again, remember uh, what we've all been taught, which is first do no harm, but in this situation, it's a little bit different. The first do no harm is to yourself and to your staff. Thank you. Yeah, Michael, thanks a lot. Um, I think uh, you really showed it nicely that um, we have to come up with recommendation, but it's hard to give the recommendation based on the evidence which is not existing. So I just, so. Yeah, I just got in the chat information that uh, the Guangzhou is ready to give the lecture, if that is correct. Uh, Michael, cool. can you just stop sharing the screen and then we can move on with Guangzhou before we have the first Q&A session. So what's ongoing? Guangzhou, you are ready to present. Dr. Zong, uh, you can start. Yeah. Not yet. No, no, nobody can hear you. I think we'll, we will move on to the question and answer session, and then later we can ask Dr. Zong to Zong. Okay.
So hi, everybody. Yeah, this is uh, Jazlyn. I'm um, chiming in from USA, Ohio, USA. Uh, thanks for having uh, me here. Uh, Melvin and I um, will be uh, going back and forth with these QA sessions, and we were provided some questions that uh, the audience was interested in. So um, uh, we will, you know, um, address those questions first and any others that come up. Melvin, do you want to start? Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, that's great. Okay, so uh, so just now I think I might give a very good lecture. Uh, so we have a a few questions. Uh, I think some put from the you know online survey. So uh, Jasmine, I guess I I know some of the questions the have been answered. Can produce. Sorry. Yeah, I think this is the uh, uh, Dr. Song is still sharing his screen. Maybe he can. He can stop sharing the screen that we can see you. And we can, at the moment, we hear you, uh, Melvin, but we cannot see you. Maybe. Uh, In March, our hospital lead. Uh, okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, the first question is uh, uh, Jesslyn. Um, what are the recommendations uh, for periprocedurally a you know outpatient bronchoscopies? I mean, what should you what should would you recommend? So uh, you know, like you said, uh, Mike and others, you know, prior to me, they uh, very rightly uh, went through all the guidelines, and there are a lot of uh, overlapping um, aspects in the guidelines uh, already. But I, I do feel. Um, uh, that, you know, the guidelines are there to guide us, but a lot also depends on what is our local institutional setting. And uh, as proceduralists, as, as, as a department of pulmonary critical care, we do um, have to cater to our local needs too. And that may um, uh, be what is the surge uh, pressure that is being put on the institution at, at what particular time and what is the availability of um, protective equipment. Um, and that can that can also guide the timeline to the procedure. So I'm going to, since we already talked about a lot of guidelines, I can tell you uh, the sort of variations in, in practices. Um, at, at my center, um, since we were expecting the surge, um, we started to prepare, prepare about a month before that. And we have tried to really utilize uh, stratifying the kind of procedures uh, beforehand. That means uh, stratifying them into what is emergent, what is urgent, what is semi-elective and elective, and giving a timeline to it so that we haven't scheduled all these procedures uh, beforehand and we are uh, stuck with a lot of demand on our end and the hospital is under pressure at the same point. So that's where uh, we started. And those criteria are pretty similar to what uh, Mike has uh, you know, outlined. Um, cancer uh, or any... Uh, disease that is at a risk of progression within the month does uh, figure under the urgent category, it means that that has to be addressed within a matter of two weeks. But it still gives a timeline that you don't have to, you can probably delay it until the next couple of days, and you can probably perform it over the coming weeks, unless there is an airway emergency that needs to be addressed earlier. So that way, the influx of patients is more stratified. And then uh, we have a screening protocol um, where every patient is called and screened beforehand. And guidelines are changing pretty frequently. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were not doing testing, but um, since more tests have become available, which is an institutional specific thing, uh, we are now able to test everybody preoperatively. And during the debate, you'll learn there are pros and cons to that also, but now we're testing everybody uh, preoperatively. Um, after the patient is screened and tested and decided to come in at a particular date, uh, we are very um, cognizant procedure-wise for our safety. We do minimize our personnel. Um, like it, it, it was mentioned before, all our procedures are done under general anesthesia, even the, even the simpler ones to avoid coughing and um, aerosolization during the procedure to avoid leaks. We do prefer to intubate everybody uh, to also minimize the leak during the procedure because LMA and eye gels, they may also have, if you need a higher peep, higher pressure during the procedure, they may have a risk of leak more than uh, the others. Um, the intubation is performed under complete apnea. If you have to do any scope exchanges, 
we ask our anesthesiologists to uh, give apnea. Uh, we follow the don donning and doffing protocols and completely uh, complete use of PP, including the face, the head, uh, the goggles, uh, N95s, and um, and uh, protective gowns. Um, and this is basically has helped us streamline our procedures uh, where we are still going through. It's, it's not that all our procedures are on hold. Even when we were surging, uh, we were able to address the urgent uh, procedures. And what we are left is more like the semi-elective and elective ones. And we, we may be looking at starting them up uh, soon, but in a slow stratified way. OK, uh, thank you, Jesslyn. So I think. Um... I, Mike has uh, previously uh, mentioned that uh, they have a, the SAB has got a uh, review and uh, sort of like a consensus uh, in JTD. And uh, I've just uh, read it and it's, uh, there's a very nice diagram inside, uh, which yes. actually sort of like uh, stratifies all the risk and timing, which is like something like what you said. So everybody yes. can get a, <laughs> a whole end of the, of the document uh, and read it. So, um, I'd like to uh, ask uh, this uh, Dr. Chen, Chen from uh, Guangzhou, uh, because I, I heard from Dr. Hari that uh, he has performed like 300 bronchoscopies uh, during this COVID period. So uh, Dr. Chen, I, I, can you hear me? Yes, I, I'm here. Yeah, so Dr. Chen, I would just like to ask, uh, uh, your bronchoscopies, uh, you actually said that they are done under general anesthesia or uh, or like, uh, you know, uh, conscious sedation or like deep sedation? I mean, uh, what is your preferred technique? For yes, this, uh, in, in this period of time uh, for diagnostic bronchoscopy, we uh, usually uh, choose conscious sedation. And if for treatments, if the patient uh, doesn't have uh, necessary for intubate, uh, we will choose um, deep sedation. Okay. Am I clear? And, uh, yeah. And then uh, for negative pressure rooms, uh, I mean, this is open to the floor. I mean, uh, you know, how many eggs changes do you do? You, do, you do? I mean, uh, are your rooms uh, equipped with? Because, uh, you know, I'm uh, asking this question because, uh, you know, there's apparently some difference uh, in the setup of uh, negative pressure rooms or what we, we define it because uh, WHO has got sort of its own definition yeah. um, I'm not hearing you quite clear uh, are you talking about if we don't have a, a negative pressure or isolation room uh, yeah because uh, you were saying that uh, you have the negative pressure room so I'm just wondering like uh, what what do you like you know in your in your setup like you know the organization of your uh, negative pressure room, like how many exchanges they actually have? Um, for uh, our for our bronchoscopy department, uh, we don't have negative pressure room. Uh, that would be in a separate uh, um, inpatient department. Uh, so uh, if for a uh, normal patient, it's not considered to be a COVID-19, we will do the patient in an isolation room. Uh, we will have uh, um, open the window and have a good airflow, and that will be fine. If for a patient that will be considered uh, maybe uh, diagnostic as a COVID-19, it will be have to be uh, doing the procedure in the negative pressure room. Okay, I think uh, in the interest of time, uh, shall we move on to the next lecture by uh, Dr. Chong, uh, Professor He? Back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for the panelists uh, for for the discussion. Now we're moving on um, with our next speaker. If that uh, um, works, now it's up to the UK. Uh, Dr. Pashal, are you ready to present? Hi, good afternoon. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great, let me just side and share my screen.
Can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah we can see the screen, sir. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody from the UK. Uh, my name is Rakesh Panchal. I'm a chest physician in Leicester. So I'd like to thank Dr. Gona Guntler um, for inviting me onto this webinar. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, COVID-19 in the UK to set the scene and then a little bit about our response um, to bronchoscopy, which I think Michael had alluded to a little bit earlier in his talk. So just for those of you who don't know, so I work in Leicester, which is in the centre of England in the Midlands, which is about 160 kilometres from uh, London. And we're one of the largest respiratory centres with a large bed base of about 129 um, beds. We've had about 200 deaths and about 600 cases in Leicester, as you can see from this um, chart, sort of the middle line is showing where the overall death rate in England, and we're quite low, but the highest rates as one can expect have been in sort of the London um, area. We've unfortunately had quite a high death rate, uh, mirroring um, our colleagues um, in France and Italy of around 20,000 so far. And one of the main concerns we've had is about the death rates in the um, BME groups. So the Health Service Journal in the UK published this. And unfortunately, we had the first death amongst a consultant ENT surgeon in our hospital in the UK. And there's been about 120 deaths since. And the interesting thing here is, is about two thirds of deaths amongst healthcare workers have been in um, those from the, the BME communities and in medical staff, 95% have been from BME communities. And actually these are also overrepresented in the most critically ill patients um, on our ICUs. And a number of factors have been uh, mentioned, whether this is a genetic susceptibility, whether it's um, their medical causes. So in the BME communities, metabolic syndrome and vitamin D deficiency is common. I mean, are there sociological causes? So the environment people are working in and whether they really are socially distancing. And obviously things that we've been talking about are the rigor of the PPE. So obviously you'd think there, there'd be a higher risk in ICUs and in bronchoscopy staff, for example, but actually that's not the case because um, the PPE rigor is maintained there. The UK sort of had a, went into lockdown around the 23rd of May, uh, sorry, March, and we had an increase in cases and obviously that's plateauing now. So I think we've sort of seen the first wave um, or the peak of the first wave um, of the pandemic in the UK. And thankfully our rates in hospital are decreasing um, and our ICUs have not been as overwhelmed as we were concerned they would be. And the death rate is also dropping. And as you can see here, um, the UK is following our um, colleagues in Italy and France, but um, you know, Germany and Sweden have had very low rates and pr perhaps Professor Hirth will be able to ex um, offer some insight on why things have been successful there, perhaps early lockdown and more widespread screening. The UK is suggesting five sort of um, tests for um, releasing the lockdown. And that's one of our concerns here about whether we may see a second wave um, as things are slowly eased. So UK bronchoscopy services. So on my way home um, from work today, I saw more people out um, on the roads, more people walking about for their daily exercise, which is uh, the UK is giving 30 minutes for people to spend outside. And I think at some point the lockdown is gonna have to be released. Um, and similarly, we're going to have to resume some business as usual at some point. Um, Michael mentioned earlier on that bronchoscopy is a semi-urgent procedure. Um, and we're going to have to start doing more of our routine cases. We've prioritized malignant patients in the UK where it alters their management. So if they're going to receive chemotherapy or they're going to be surgical candidates and we need to stage them, then we will do these patients. We'll review all our cases through a triage service or an MDT to decide whether the bronchoscopy is really needed. We've postponed non-malignant cases, um, but we are doing cases, for example, high-risk infection, so TB and complex infection. Um, we're not routinely testing um, bronchoscopy staff or patients pre-bronchoscopy at the moment, but I think that's going to change. It's certainly changing in our institution. And we're certainly not performing bronchoscopy for COVID diagnosis. We think the clinical syndrome of the fever, cough, and typical radiological findings will suffice. And I think a bronchoscopy um, would add very little here, although I know that's what some colleagues in Italy were doing, as Michael mentioned. So what are we saying in the UK? The British Thoracic Society actually has released these recommendations. And actually, there's a great repository of lots of um, recommendations for various disease areas. And I'd encourage people to look at that on the British Thoracic Society website, which is free to have a look at. So in anyone who's suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19, 
we have specifically stated that you need to delay bronchoscopy by 28 days. That's on the basis that in the UK, we suggest that if someone's got symptoms or they screen positive for COVID, we ask them to isolate for seven days and we ask their family to self-isolate for 14 days because we think that's the highest type period or risk when they're going to develop um, COVID and the viral shedding is going to be higher. So we think 28 days is a ballpark safe um, time to delay their procedure. Obviously, there are concerns in some cancer patients where that could lead to upstaging of their illness and obviously that needs to be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis with the bronchoscopist and via your tumor board or your MDT. Um, we will contact patients at least a day prior to the procedure and then take screening, so asking the questions about fever, contact uh, with patients with COVID and if there's a positive to that will delay by 28 days. Only if patients have got no symptoms or any contact or any imaging which is showing any um, non grand glass changes or COVID pictures, then will we proceed to um, bronchoscopy. And that's illustrated in this algorithm here. Um, but although people are saying we're not doing the non malignant indications, as I said, TB and um, complex infection, we are doing. But anything else, valves, thermoplasty, sarcoid cases have all been put on the back burner. We get a lot of referrals from our hematology colleagues saying patients are immunosuppressed. Again, we'd probably say treat them empirically unless there's a real need that I think is going to change management, we will defer these um, procedures. So it's always interesting to see what our colleagues are doing. So um, as I said, the first death of a medic in the UK was an ENT surgeon in our, in our institution. And the ENT surgeons have been very strict. And this is the guidelines from ENT UK saying that they will only undertake nasal endoscopy in the highest risk um, patients. And even then they'll have the most senior operator doing that procedure. I've seen patients where there've been uh, recommendations where they're wearing masks with a perforation where they can insert the scope in. I think that might be a bit more difficult for our patients because we've got the, our nurse suctioning the patient's mouth. And obviously we need to have oxygen there as well. So we do a lot of our bronchoscopy under conscious sedation. The British Society of Gastroenterology has also been very strict and similarly um, followed um, sort of American guidelines about emergencies, um, those can be deferred and for cancer patients they've actually deferred any activity for six weeks and are starting to do what we call two-week weight cancer uh, GI endoscopy but they will be wearing full a, um, PPE including FFP3 masks for as they consider their procedures to be aerosol generating as well. We've seen this quite a lot from Professor Hearth and Dr. Pritchard earlier on about the societal guidelines of bronchoscopy. The British guidelines were not actually on there, but I think they came out a little bit later. So yes, we are postponing elective activity. We are screening patients according to symptoms, but um, I think we are going, a lot of places in the UK are already doing um, swabbing patients pre-bronchoscopy, and we're going to start that in our institution as of this week, because I think as we're seeing asymptomatic carriage, we think COVID is going to be endemic in the population for some time now, uh, for some time to come. So I think we need to swab them to try and mitigate the risk to the staff and as much as we can. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in the pro-con debate that Kyle and Dr. Falk are doing a bit later. We are doing it in a negative pressure room and we, it's important to contact your infection prevention and protocol infection prevention team to see how many air exchanges you need. So we're saying about six to eight. And in our unit, that takes probably about 18 minutes. Um, we are wearing FFP3 masks, goggles, visors, and in a hairnet, as well as gowns and gloves. And actually, we're going to probably start using the um, respirators as well. As I explained, we use conscious sedation, so we're using midazolam fentolin, and we do, do use local anesthetic um, to anesthetize the oropharynx. So this is what we're doing in my institution. If you get referred for a bronchoscopy, we, we will triage that through our lung cancer team. Um, or to be vetted by a bronchoscopy clinician such as myself. If we think there is an alternative target, so a CT guided biopsy or an, a biopsy of a lymph node will suffice, that, or, so ultrasound neck, then we will do that over a bronchoscopy. Our bronchoscopy coordinator will phone the patient and do screening questions, and if they are positive to that, we'll delay by 28 days. If the screening is negative, then we will undertake a PCR swab test at least 48 to 72 hours before the investigation. Ideally, we want to do it as close as possible because of logistics. In my institution, the PCR takes about 24 hours um, to get back, and we haven't got the Kefid rapid 45-minute test yet. Our bronchoscopy coordinator will then call the patient a day before, ask the questions again, and let them know the results of the swab. And if it's negative, we will list them for the procedure. If it's positive, then we'll delay by 28 days. 
Um, a lot of centres will also be referring patients in for EBUS, so we're asking our local centres to perform those swabs prior to their referral. On the day of the procedure, we're trying to um, limit how many patients we put on a list, so we do a four-hour list and we'll probably keep about three or four patients on the list to try and space them out and allow time for air exchanges in the negative pressure room. When they arrive, we ask all the patients to arrive in one time and we socially distance them on the ward or our, on our day case unit and we try and manage them in the side room where possible to try and minimise spread. Our endoscopy nurse will do some observations, check the COVID swab is negative, which hopefully will be, and then we will do a medical review and consent all patients in one sitting. We'll then ensure there's sufficient FF, uh, sorry, PPE and we'll don all that at one time. We don't, want to be keep, we don't want to keep coming in and out of the bronchoscopy suite. We want, obviously, masks are limited. And what we've sort of said is you try and wear the same mask and visor for all the cases and try and change your gowns and gloves um, because of limited stock. We've limited personnel and obviously we'll try and have our interventional fellow or a trainee if absolutely necessary, but we have a senior bronchoscopist in. We have 30 pulmonologists in our department, but only six of us are scoping. Um, we ensure samples are sent in biohazard bags and recover the patient in a side room to try and minimise um, exposure to the other patients in the unit. And obviously doffing and, and disposing of the PPE is important. If any of that's not available, then we have a very low threshold to delay or cancel the procedure. This is what we're wearing at the moment. The Public Health England have given us this sort of visual guide of aerosol generating procedures, so CPAP, NIV, ICUs, bronchoscopy, we should be wearing FFP3. Um, the health and safety executive in the UK has said that we should wear FFP3. It provides um, better filtering, 20 times filtering um, of uh, particles compared to the N95 or the uh, FFP2 masks. Um, and we're now going to be, as of the end, within the next few weeks, using the respirators as routine because we were mass fit tested in our departments, but we've, re we've ran out of those masks. So we're actually using any FFP3 mask at the moment. Um, and it's not possible to mass, uh, uh, mass uh, fit test everybody. So we're using any FFP3 mask at the moment, but I think that's risky. So we're going to be using the respirators as a matter of routine um, from uh, next week. One trial I'd just like to um, encourage people to be aware of in the UK is something called a recovery trial. So um, a lot of colleagues around the world have been using different treatments, prophylactic treatments, and none are pro, you know, there's no evidence for them, and I suppose that's difficult in the current pandemic. So the NHR has funded um, a trial with 173 centres in the UK now. We've recruited 6,000. This is an adaptive trial um, uh, protocol where patients are randomised to either lopinavir, ritinavir, low-dose steroids, hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin, um, and they can go home with this treatment and we're trying to recruit all patients being admitted to a hospital who test positive for on swab. And if there's evidence of progressive decline, then there can be a second randomization to the IL-6 therapy tocilizumab. And so it'd be interesting, uh, I'd encourage people to sort of follow this trial. So conclusions, I think we need to sort of, we've all been very strict about our services and stopped um, all real bronchoscopy except for the most essential and largely that's in cancer patients but we need to start planning for COVID endemic circumstances and start undertaking some of the routine work. We need to be aware of asymptomatic carriage, and I think we should certainly co uh, consider pre-bronchoscopy swabbing of patients to try and mitigate risk, and perhaps even um, test high-risk staff such as ourselves doing bronchoscopy. In our infectious diseases unit, they stack they, where you think the PPE is quite robust, negative pressure rooms, um, and you think it's quite a safe environment, they, they swabbed um, their medical staff who were asymptomatic and they picked up a 30% positive rate. So um, I, I think that's interesting and I'm, I'm looking forward to the pro-con debate. I think going forward, managing services is gonna depend on rapid access to quick and decent tests, maybe 45 minute kefir tests, which are supposed to be coming soon. Um, and obviously access to PPE. I certainly say we need to be safe and we have a responsibility to protect ourselves and our staff. Um, as, as I think this COVID, uh, uh, the coronavirus is not going any, any time, anywhere time soon, and I think we're going to be probably having at least one or two further waves throughout this year. So, thank you very much. Yeah, Arke, th thanks a lot. Uh, nice overview. And you mentioned a couple of times uh, the role of testing before the procedure, and uh, so therefore we move forward directly to Kylie. Mm, because his topic is exactly covering that. Uh, 
uh, when should we do the tests before bronchoscopy and what kind of tests we do? Kylie, up yep. to you. All right. Are you able to see, I'm uh, doing the share, so are you able to see? Yeah, we can, uh, see you. we can see the screen and we can hear you. All right, it's, we're two for two. Well, uh, good morning, evening, etc. for everybody. Um, I've been asked uh, to have the pro-con debate with uh, my good friend, Eric. Uh, I'll just go ahead and tell you right up front, I'm gonna win. So uh, COVID-19 testing prior to Bronk, I think the answer is not yes or no, it's of course. Um, so let's move forward and I'll give you my argument. Uh, these slides have been Trump approved. Uh, so you can get yourself some inhaled Lysol or some IV Clorox. So, and, and then not that this is relevant to any of the topics, but this is my conflict of interest, none of which has anything to do with what we're talking about today, but there it is for fun. Um, so why are we here? So this is the slide, or this is the screenshot this morning from the Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. And, and we're here because of the 3 million plus confirmed cases worldwide and the 217,000 confirmed deaths. And then in the US, the current amount of test results. So that's why we're here. We're dealing obviously with a large problem and it's a problem that's everywhere. And as the people that are caring for all kinds of patients, um, we are incumbent upon protecting ourselves and our own families while doing our best to help our patient population. So as a slide has been up before, um, I think the first question of all bronchoscopy, and, and obviously uh, this audience knows well, before we do any procedure, it's always the debate as the procedure needed, and that's before COVID, right? And so what's the urgency and what's the utility to the procedure? Uh, you know, it's the usual. I, I just got asked to do a bronchoscopy on someone who apparently no one examined because there's palpable lymph nodes in the supraclavicular space. So why don't we go after the simplest, least aerosol creating procedure, et cetera. So this, this set of guidelines, and, and I think um, everybody in their own clinical example, it might modify what's acute or urgent or subacute, et cetera, but that's not the point. It is to set up a framework. And I think the purpose of a lot of these guidelines for both inpatient and outpatient is to give each of us um, the framework to be able to approach administration when you're being asked to do something uh, the, you know, that is relevant or not relevant. And they'll say, well, what are you basing it upon? And you can say, well, here are the relevant guidelines. And, and some of these have already been talked about. There are multiple guidelines and I, I'm just uh, put pictures up of these three as has been demonstrated. There are guidelines that are relevant to each individual country and then in individual regions, some published by societies. And you know, they are as evidence-based approach as one is, can think is possible. Uh, in an ever-changing uh, set of circumstances, our ability to say that we are doing something that's definitively evidence-based is quite limited, obviously. So then how do we guide ourselves? Well, let's start with some common themes from the inpatient side. Uh, this was a, a slide uh, presented earlier. Um, the common themes on the inpatient side are to avoid bronchoscopy at all possible in known or suspected COVID patients. But as our data in the outpatient world is showing, just about everybody should be considered suspected in some form. And that if we're going to bronc, we want to maximize our PPE. Well, that comes back to an issue of resource allocation. We want to make sure we have adequate staffing and minimize staffing uh, exposures. So again, that comes back to testing. We need to make sure we're using specialized rooms and then all the various dining and doffing, et cetera. Um, and so do we need to even be doing the bronchoscopy? And if we're going to be doing doing it, shouldn't we do it in a way that minimizes the exposure to our staff, ourselves, and other patients in recovery, et cetera? So that's how I actually think we should pose this question. It's not a pro-con of testing prior to an outpatient ambulatory bronchoscopy. It's that if you're going to scope someone, why would you not test? And so um, there's one argument, you were already going to be wearing PPE. The other one, of course, is that there's limited test availability. So why should we be, quote, wasting it on somebody who isn't symptomatic anyway? I completely agree with what everyone has said. We pre-screen and call. If you have any form of an infectious symptom, we are going to wait. Uh, we're not going to be scoping you. So let's go back to the N95 mask. Um, recall, of course, that N95 respirators are made of special material that removes at least 95% of even the small droplets. So right up front, a bronchoscopy, even with all of our gear on an aerosolizing creating procedure, 
does carry some risk to the provider. Is that 95% good enough for your health? And then by proxy, you're going home, I hope afterwards, to your family's health. One of the ways, of course, that viruses and pandemics continue to spread is the unknowing uh, spread of the disease. And the classic, classic example being tuberculosis. And so the whole idea that we as a collective medical community would put ourselves at risk without properly vetting a patient um, using equipment that is good, but not amazing. And as we know, Mike showed this earlier, we have lost colleagues. We are continuing to lose colleagues. Um, and our, arguably what I keep asking in, in these conferences, when people talk about doing bronchoscopy on a COVID positive patient, what I've failed to hear is how it has changed outcomes in a mortality way. We've heard of bronch to remove mucus secretions. Okay, so the x-ray might have looked better the next day, but did that change an outcome? Our patient's still living. If the patient still dies, then you took an unnecessary exposure to a physician. Now the next question, of course, is testing. If we say we're gonna test all outpatients um, that will consume testings and tests are a limited resource still, unfortunately. So how limited are they? Well, there's been a lot of tests going on in the United States. So I would argue that a, a few of them to test for patients before we expose ourselves as a profession, we got some room to spare here. And we are in the middle of a crisis. So we can obviously turn to ethicists and moral and ethical established principles that help guide us. So this isn't a selfish decision. Let's look at what happens in a crisis standard of care. So substantial change in the usual healthcare operations and the level of care that is possible to deliver, which is made necessary by a pervasive or catastrophic disaster. The same general rules that we would have applied back a year ago do not apply in a current scenario. These are guidelines for how to behave in these crisis modes. Making it hyperlocal for myself, the Illinois Department of Public Health defines it. And in a crisis care, again, the same idea that not enough to meet all needs. So we we're trying to provide the best care possible. And this of course goes on everything. This talks about ventilators and so forth. But let's again, bring it back to preoperative testing. So what are the ethics here? So there are principles established that help to prioritize why protecting a healthcare provider is extremely important. The one is the instrumental value that healthcare workers can ultimately come back to worth, work if they recover. So we should prioritize them at all costs because we're the ones directly involved in providing patient care in all aspects, whether that's critical care, whether that's pulmonary consultation. That's a utilitarian argument in the world of ethics. Also the issue of reciprocity, that healthcare workers put themselves at risk for others on a daily basis. So they quote, deserve the resource to protect them. That's a principle paced argument. Now, again, these are just generic arguments, but that so that we think about testing preoperatively, not as a uh, scenario of just, oh, we're special. There are guidelines on how to prioritize in a crisis situation, the various limited resources. And in, the, in, a, in a nice article in the New England Journal, same idea here, highlighting the idea of um, uh, priority to healthcare workers from a perspective, those who are likely to make relevant contributions, keeping people healthy. I, I can speak for my own institution, if you are not required to be at the medical center because you're covering a specific service or doing a specific procedure, then under no circumstances are we supposed to be anywhere near the building. I notice on a lot of people's Zooms, it sure looks like you're at home um, and you should be. Um, if you're not providing direct care, do not expose yourself. If I am providing direct care, so this is what I walk around with when I'm near anybody, but this is what I'm gonna be putting on as soon as this conference is done because I have a series of procedures that need to be done even though every single person has been tested negative because we've been instructed at all costs to protect ourselves so that we may continue to provide care. So as mentioned earlier, you can say, I can say all this, I can talk about you know, ethical principles. We can talk about guidelines. What about the real world? So in a nice hospital in Northern Ohio, they started outpatient testing and the 16 asymptomatic screen patients, four of them had positive results. And obviously their bronchoscopy has then been postponed. And those are four patients that would have undergone standard of care procedure, presumably with docs wearing the a protective gear, but why take an unnecessary risk? 
Again, going back to the triage question of how emergent is this bronchoscopy? Um, how needed is this versus waiting um, a period of time, X amount of weeks before we retest and re-proceed. Re, uh, and so with that, I will say thank you um, and get out of the way and, and make room for Eric. Um, and uh, that's a picture of uh, my medical center and my emails down below if other questions or concerns pop up. But um, thank you so much. And I will hit stop share and make room for Eric. Hi. Hi, Dave. Thanks a lot. Uh, now a tough job for Eric now because you already changed your title to, of course. Uh, <laughs> so Eric, <laughs> will you have an can, answer? <laughs> can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, let me share my screen. You able to see my slides? Yes, we sure can. In okay. The in the presentation mode. Perfect. Is that better? You have. To, I think you have two screens now. You have two monitors at the can moment. You, can you flip your mode to, to present mode as opposed to slide preview mode? Oh, Dr. Kyle, I think you should uh, mute your mic. Uh, yes, I will. <laughs> I'm just. I'm just trying. Trying to help my esteemed colleague through the tech support. Sorry. Sorry. Is that better? It's like watching you bronc, Eric. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm I'm clumsy, but I'm giving you a little advantage because this is gonna be an, an easy win. Okay, so these are my disclosures, and uh, they're not relevant to the topic I'm gonna be speaking about, but I I, I they will not affect what I have to say today other than I don't like uh, Hogarth and I will enjoy uh, proving him wrong. So as, as Kyle, Mike uh, and Dr. Hearth and others mentioned, some factors co to consider when we do an aerosol generating procedure are what are the, what is the urgency of the procedure? What actions are we going to take with it? For example, treatment of lung cancer. And the clinical perspective, what is the patient looking like? Why are we doing this in relationship to the possibility? Are they infected? What is the prevalence of COVID in our community as well as influenza? Because hopefully my message will resonate as time goes by and we get into the summer and we get into next year. And what are the current protocols? Because in my hospital, the decisions of who we test and how much we test depends on the central control and the availability of this. So at the beginning of the PN epidemic, we were using a clinical presentation until we figured out that there were 15, 20% patients or more in the community that were asymptomatic and shedding virus. So we change our ways. So we can't use um, the, the, what the patient tells us about symptom wise in order to guide our uh, consideration whether they're infected or not infected. So when we schedule a case that we don't know the status and we determine is it worth the risk, we have to use, my argument is that we have to use protective equipment regardless of the testing status. And I'll try to prove that over the next eight minutes or so. So as Mike presented this slide, it's a small sample, but you can tell uh, from this data that the um, prediction ability of these tests in nasal swabs as well as pharyngeal swabs is very limited. They're not particularly helpful. And I'll present more data to that effect. However, the bronchial viral lavage, at least in this study, was highly predictive. But this is after the fact. We've already bronched the patient by this point. So let's put this in perspective. Let's talk about a frequently thrown number in studies in Europe and China. If we have a RT-PCR with a sensitivity of 70% and a specificity of 95%, let's assume you're doing this in a, in a population with a prevalence of 80%. I can't think of a, a, a higher number, but if you do this in 100 people that have uh, symptoms that are similar to those concerning for us, right? This is gonna be the result, 57% of those. So we said prevalence of 80%, right? So the, re, the truth, the ultimate truth is we have 80, 80 people sick and 20 people healthy. Out of those 80 people, 57 
will have a true positive test. 43% will test negative. But when we further look into that, we identify that there's a significant number of false negatives. In other words, um, they, as you can see here, 56 people are true positives, right? One person will be a false positive. 24 people will be a false negative. This is problematic, right? We thought they were negative. We may be not taking the necessary precautions for our, us and our team. And finally, 19 people will be true negative. So when you look at these numbers and you scratch your head and you say, well, but he's using a prevalence of 80%, right? Well, let me change these numbers. How about if I lower the prevalence to 10%? If we do the prevalence of 10%, you will have four false positives, three false negatives, right? And 86 true uh, negatives and seven true positives. But as you can see, the negative predictive value and the accuracy are highly impacted by the prevalence. So let me break this down even further. So for those of you who like Bayesian statistics, if you have a patient with a prevalence of 10%, so you have a pretest probability of 10% and you do your test with, again, I said the sensitivity of 70%, this will only take you here, okay? If it's negative, it'll only take you to 4%. So out of 100 people in the population, 10 will truly be sick, 90 will be well. Out of these ones that are sick, seven will be true positives and three will be falsely classified as negative. Not such a helpful test anymore. So let me go for prevalence of 90%. If you're 90% and it's positive, you'll go to over 99 or 100%. But if it is negative, it won't get you out of the hornet's net nest because you would be over 70%. So same thing again, 100 patients, 90 will be sick in, in this, uh, in this uh, model, 63 will be true positives, but 27 false negative. So it is not a problem of testing. I would love to test if we had a highly sensitive, highly specific test, but we just don't have that. Now, I use 70%, you may not like that number, so I'm gonna give you a little more evidence. Cleveland Clinic, used 239 known samples to be positive. They ran them through five different tests. The super uh, new uh, test of Abbott that gives you results in a few minutes gave you an 85% sensitivity. So 15% of those cases were told they were negative and that was a mistake. The diasaurin simplex are 89%. The CDC RT-PCR that takes several days, even a week or two, is 100% if you can wait for that long. The Roche test, 96%, and the CIFID test, 98%. Alan Wells from the University of Pittsburgh ran a similar experiment. Both of these have not been published yet or uh, been peer reviewed, but the data is available for your uh, review online. How about when we, when we look at the experience of our colleagues in China with uh, CT scan versus RT-PCR. So this very ingenious study published in radiology looked at 81 patients that uh, showed up to Taizu Ends uh, Medical Center and 30 were excluded, but 51 patients had both a CT scan and um, a PCR test. And out of those 51 patients, 15 um, had a negative swab test. The CAT scans were very concerned, but 15 were negative. 35 were matching. And one case had actually a PCR that was positive, but the CT scan was negative. This shows to you that actually, I'm not sure you can necessarily conclude this, but in this study, 98% of the patients uh, were identified by CAT scan and only 71% were identified by RT-PCR. As of this morning, my colleagues in a multi-country study uh, published a pre-publication -pre data on a systematic review. This is a group from Spain, uh, England, Switzerland, and perhaps I'm missing another country. Here, they collaborated in this systematic review and they identified that the different published studies showed 
15 false negatives here, 12, 12, and obviously over time, the studies that actually were able to swap people over time show the false negatives decreasing by repeated testing. Now, what if you told me, well, how about if we use antibody testing? I can't give you um, as many publications with antibodies, but I have this table that comes directly from the manufacturers in which they say the sensitivity and specificity of their individual essays is equal or, or better than the RT-PCR. So my claim would not be that you don't test. My claim would be you can test all you want. I hope you protect yourselves. I hope you don't trust the results blindly. And I hope that with increasing data that gets published, we are all able to make better decisions. In my hospital right now, uh, there's a mandate to test twice. In other words, we test and if it's negative, we test again in an attempt to increase the, the sensitivity of the study. We are doing tracheostomies because we, we are reaching critical numbers and because it, we've had very good results, but we are using N95, face shield, and the other recommendations that we posted in the um, SAB uh, guidelines. So with that, I would love to hear some questions. Eric, thanks again. Better responded. Um, so really, on the calculation based, trying to give us a clear guidance. And I want to ask now our host uh, to give to share with us his experience with doing Bronx. Um, so Harry, I give it back to you. Um, thank you, Professor. And. Uh... We are not uh, doing active bronchoscopies as for the, we are, right now we are following the SAB guidelines. That was um, in the beginning when we started doing, uh, right now we are in the, getting into the peak of uh, COVID-19. Uh, so actually we are not doing, and we are not screening all patients for bronchoscopy as well, because there is very uh, less number of testing being done and we don't have the adequate uh, testing facilities available at this moment. So that is the main reason why uh, we have done this meeting to see how we can go about testing and all these things. Good. So then? Uh, you... One more point I would like to raise on the rigid bronchoscopy aspect. So, Dr. Kyle or Erica, you can. I'll defer to Eric. Um... So my, my problem with rigid bronchoscopy has been, um, it's a highly aerosolizing procedure and anesthesia has been very hesitant. Um, what I have uh, been doing is I have two or three anesthesiologists that are willing to do it with PAPR and we are only doing it in the circumstances that are necessary, absolutely necessary. For example, uh, critical airway obstruction. And in those right. cases, we are using um, a closed ventilation system. We normally use jet. In these cases, we're using closed ventilation. I'm not sure that improves uh, logarithmically the, the risk, but uh, that's what we've been doing. I think, I mean, I think, you know, in the, the, the joys of a pro con debate, really in the end, the, the slide that I think everyone has shown mm -hmm. comes back to the, the triage of the need for the bronchoscopy, right? The, the, the procedure that, you know, with or without testing, whatever level of risk, we as a profession take on that risk if the procedure is very necessary. I think the, the, the spirit of this whole discussion centers around culture, I think we are all doers and we like to help. We, we like to intervene, provide care, et cetera. And that normal reflex of, yes, we'll do it, has to be tempered by the, whoa, 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 how safe is this? Do we need to do this? And so I would agree uh, 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 with Eric from the perspective of you know any form of a, of a bronchoscopy, no matter what the patient scenario, if it's of a critical airway stenosis, for example, um, is a reasonable risk that can be mitigated if you have the appropriate equipment. What I would say is if you're in a scenario where you have no ability to obtain that equipment on a critical airway stenosis, um, then I would argue that that bronchoscopy, rigid or flexible, should not be performed. 
because you're not protecting yourself. And as the principles in a crisis, uh, you know, would tell us in, a, in, a, in the ethical principles, you know, there are a limited supply of people that can care for the greater good and the better ability to save more people, losing more doctors in an effort to save one person defies all ethical principles on that have you know been codified for what to do in a scenario like this. Yeah, I, I echo a little bit on Kylie. I think at the end it's always a local decision. What you can do, yes. what is your what is your local situation, how much testing or how less testing you get, how quick you get tests. There are so many local factors that you only can decide it at the end case by case. I think this is what we're doing everybody around the world making an individualized decision. But I think what we all learned in the past, we never have really taken care about the stuff and the risk of the stuff. That was never the issue. When you look to India or China, still having a lot of TB. TB is also a disease which is uh, transmitted by aerosols. So we have had some precautions, but now that I think this is something we should have in mind. Also in the future, in the after COVID times, we have to take care of the stuff as well and do not being the guys who want to do action. I agree on that. It's a, culture, it's a culture shift for all of us, right? By definition, we want to do procedures to help people. Mm -hmm. And that, that desire to first pause um, you know, is I think very real. And you know, and in the pro con argument, I mean, Eric brings up a good point about the limitations of all these tests, and obviously availability of the tests uh, matters. And so, as Felix just said, it is going to always, I think, be hyper local. I, I like I like forums like this, so that so much data gets presented, so that an individual, no matter where they are, can at least obviously utilize this and help frame their own discussion for their, you know, just their medical center and or their region, state, you know federal level, et cetera. So I think there's a high value to this. And there's clearly no one answer. And especially in the in the uh, procedures where we have really a higher risk like Richard Bronchoscopy, uh, when you do it, when you can really postpone such a procedure for 24 hours that you can wait for the test results, you, the test result is still 24 hours old, yeah? And it might be that you swap too early yeah? and the patient get really, positive at the day of the procedure. So there's always time limitation and questions. And at the end, I think it's it's a point which you have to do really that what we have to decide case by case. And for sure, some people around the world will come in a triage situation that should you do in, in stage four lung cancer patient, 82 years old, severe airway obstruction, received multiple chemos and radiation therapy, should you put your staff and yourself on a risk to put a stand in? Or is the time over for that patient? I'm relatively sure in, in our health system, we have a lot of beds, we have a lot of capacity, we have access to all the masks. I don't think that that will happen in Germany. And I don't think that will happen in, in the high volume center in the US, but I'm relatively sure worldwide, there are colleagues in such a situation that they have to make that decision. Can I just ask a question on the swabbing? So if you swab a patient, so we're about to start this in our center. So if we swab a patient before their bronchoscopy and it's positive, we're going to delay the procedure by 28 days in the UK. One question that keeps coming up is, should we re-swab them? There's limited tests. Positive swab only implies, you know, they're shedding virus right now. It's, they're infected right now. Are we assuming that once they've sort of got over it and they've got no, you know, they're should we, should we re-swab is one question. And the second question is, are people in high-risk areas, for example, the bronchoscopy suite, swabbing their staff? And should that be done um, to, because if we're asymptomatic carriers, we're working elsewhere, we're moving on, we might be passing it on to other people, despite, you know, our best efforts to wear PPE. Um, so there are two sort of things we're grappling with. So we're def definitely going to start swabbing, but should we re-swab in those people who are positive or is there no point? And how about swabbing of staff in high-risk areas? Yeah, maybe I can start with that. So we, we have uh, test capacities in our institution. So we're offering the, the, the staff members of the bronchoscopy, uh, the bronch staff, but also the ICU staff as well, 
as the stuff of the interventional radiologist, because when they're doing CT guided needle aspirations or CT punctures, patient is coughing as well sometimes. Eh? So, and we offering them swaps. Um, a couple of people, a couple of staff are going for that. Until now, we only, we never have had a positive swap in those. Eh? So it seems the protection recommendation we have out using masks and using coats and gloves um, seems to working. Regarding the re-swapping, we just have had a debate uh, here in Germany and uh, RKI, which is our national association uh, recommending or everything. So they stopped recommending to re-swap patients after 14 days. Even they have had a positive result before because we have seen a lot of patients who have positive swaps about over four weeks after six weeks. And then we try to isolate the virus. And we learned that we, what we're looking for with the swaps with the PCR is we're looking for genetic material. And that might be from a dead virus, which is still there. So, so the official recommendation for Germany is don't re-swap. Uh, so what we're doing in patients where we have a positive swap, we're waiting for 14 days and then we're doing the procedure. So I'll tell my experience. Uh, one is uh, there's a paper coming out of nature in the near future showing that exactly what uh, Felix just mentioned, that the genetic material is present for a very long period of time and its predictability is limited. In other words, they were not able to culture it, even though they were able to identify genetic material. So the fact that it is still RT-PCR positive is hard to interpret. The second question is, how do we protect our staff? We created at Mass General a small app, app in, for the phone and on the internet that the employees every day log in before going to work they have to answer their symptoms. And if they say no symptoms, they sign, and then they get a, a reply saying, you're able to come to work. This opens the, the possibility to the patient to say, I'm not feeling good. And, and if they're not feeling good, they get, to, they get referred automatically for testing, right? We do not test the worried well, even though we're missing a percentage of people, but if you're a healthcare provider and you're concerned of exposure with testing. So a combination of symptom and healthcare provider is what we use. Uh, we don't randomly swap people. I suspect we're gonna do a study of antibodies, but I'm speaking out of turn. I don't, I don't know if that's gonna be, I think checking for antibodies to see who we missed may be an interesting way about it. Yeah, I think that as you mentioned, uh, even we seeing so we have we have uh, broad access to tests, so we know so we have a little bit idea how uh, about the rate of uh, of people we are testing. They never have had symptoms. They never have any signs of disease, but still have had a positive swap. Uh, so there. So the, the question is only relying on do you have fever? Do you have do you have symptoms? As you mentioned, you miss a couple of those, but those data we only can get when we really start screening, mass screening, so everybody is swapped, and then you have an idea how many people really have it. The only data set I have seen until now is coming from Iceland. I think it was published in the New England Journal a couple of days before, where they, they offered the people without symptoms uh, free screening, and they found it that in 10,000 Icelanders, they found um, zero point in zero point eight percent. They found a swap positive signal. So that means the the, the rate of people we don't know might be one percent. And for Germany, that means that we should have at the end by having eighty millions, we have about seventy seven hundred thousand Germans infected. Actually, we're knowing about one hundred sixty thousand. So maybe five times more people have been infected without any symptoms. So all those are possible um, people when you have them on the Bronx suite who can infect yourself. So I think at the moment by all those numbers, we don't know. For me, it's only protect yourself and protect your team by wearing the mask, 
wearing the, the Google for the, the, the glasses and uh, protect yourself. Huh? I mean, we, we did a, a quick trial well, in a high risk area, so our infectious disease war, where you think the protection would be quite good. And they agreed to increase the cutting doctors by 30%. So I think it was one of the, uh, about three to four of the 10 were positive. And we were quite surprised by that, which makes you think, well, perhaps in high risk areas, should we be screening asymptomatic staff? Because it'll pick up areas where perhaps the PPE doffing and donning of the procedures are not robust and they are exposing themselves. I mean, it's, it's tricky. You know, so it's an interesting thought because, you know, are, you know are, are, are our procedures as robust as we really think they are? They are and perhaps in the Bronx suites, we think we're okay, but one argument at the moment is whether we're, if we're going to stop the patients, let's stop ourselves every week as well, maybe. I don't know to whether we've acquired anything. I don't know. It's, uh, it's a tricky one, but it creates a lot of angst amongst the staff, of, uh, naturally. Well, and I think, I mean, in, in, this, in a world of unknown, I think, if nothing else, the, uh, the principle that we've used about the, the you know, pre op testing um, the day prior. Recognizing, you know, the slides that Eric showed, we're missing people. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that that was, you know, mm -hmm. one day this morning. Mm -hmm. um, some of that is to provide that that higher level of reassurance, I think, to to everyone. But that all being said, we just still assume that every patient has it and put on the full protective gear before we do the procedure, so that everyone has that higher assurance that we're going to be doing, you know, these uh, ambulatory procedures. So patients that are no longer emergent. Uh, um, you know, semi-urgent or whatever you want to define a, a lung nodule or lymph nodes as. Um, and it, 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 I suppose in the end, that's that same recognition that we're always still putting ourselves at risk the same way we've always been putting ourselves at risk for tuberculosis and, and other things at the same time. Um, you know, it, it does, we all know, it comes with the territory, but I guess the thought process is at least we're minimizing. I know in our institution, if you are positive, we won't scope you for 28 days. Um, we're probably not going to retest you based on some of the stuff that is, you know, people are saying here. Um, and um, well, again, we're going to always wear the protective gear. We have not been offering testing uh, to just random testing to staff more because even though there are enough tests in our institution, we're, I think like everybody waiting for another wave to hit and wanting to preserve resources uh, at the moment until we know that we are flush with uh, testing and, and, and test kits, et cetera, et cetera. Another issue that we have had at our center uh, since we introduced this preoperative testing is that um, a lot of uh, the patients themselves who are traveling from far since they're supposed to quarantine themselves, um, we still need like 48 hours and they are resistant to coming back and then going back again and trying to quarantine themselves. So logistics of having that happen has, ha has led to a bit of confusion more recently. Hopefully, things will get more streamlined as faster results become available. But uh, more than numbers and all, sometimes those logistic issues uh, become uh, a problem too. Um, Hari, do you think we should move on to like some, there are a couple of Q and A's that we have left from what the audience had requested. Yeah, I think uh, we will move to the question and answer session. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Catherine here joined us from, yeah. uh, and uh, Dr. Michael Abesi. Uh, I think we can ask their experiences as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I there was one question specifically who were people were interested to know regarding how um, cancer care itself has changed. Besides the fact that we are a bit maybe delayed in doing the procedures, are we viewing diagnostic diagnosis and staging differently in these times, purposely avoiding uh, the bronchoscopy part? In the sense, like uh, is now pet avidity. Uh, seen um, as as a good source of staging rather than you know doing an ebus in everybody. Uh, are are the oncologists more open at your centers um, regarding that? Um, and is uh, are the lung nodule biopsies being deferred more to um, CT guided routes uh, rather than bronchoscopy? Has has our approach towards diagnosis and change uh, and uh, staging changed? Um, uh, what would be your opinion? I would start with Melvin, and then I'm going to open that out to the house. Melvin, are you still there? Ah, uh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So I think uh, for eBus, um, 
I think it shouldn't change our practice because uh, as uh, you know, uh, we all know that uh, if like, for example, if you want PET or CT, and I think there's very good evidence that uh, I think from paper not, I think some time back uh, saying that, you know, comparing this bimodality, trimodality, right? And then the, obviously that uh, with trimodality with uh, invasive sampling, uh, improves mortality in this lung cancer patient. So I think uh, there isn't any, I don't think a uh, PET will be, be able to replace uh, EVAS, uh, as we also know that the sensitivity and uh, specificity of the uh, PET is uh, nowhere near uh, invasive sampling. But of course, uh, like I, before we even talk about sampling, I think uh, just, I think was it uh, Carl who said, uh, yeah, I mean, if you've got a stage four, I mean, no, I mean, supraclavicular limb nodes, uh, you know, the kind of thing. Uh, you should actually aim for the, uh, you know, uh, less invasive testing rather than going for bronchoscopic procedures. Uh, with regards to CT guided biopsy, um, I think, yeah, uh, but I think it's got, we have to, you know, sort of uh, determine the, the risk of the procedure itself. I mean, you know, for example, if it's going to be very central lesions, uh, you know, CT with guided biopsy is definitely still going to be more dangerous for the patient, uh, you know, uh, probably high incidence of uh, pneumothorax uh, as compared to, you know, uh, bronchoscopy. Uh, so I think um, it's not going to change, uh, um, you know, staging very much in my opinion that uh, I think the cancer, usual cancer care, the standard of care, I think it should go on. Uh, and, but like in, like in Singapore, uh, at least uh, I was like asked to draw the bronchoscopy guidelines um, I think uh, in the end of uh, January, uh, I think just before the first case hit our shores. So I, my, I mean, my principle is that you have assumed all of them to be uh, COVID positive. So in our uh, in bronchoscopy suite, we do it under negative pressure rooms. Uh, and I mean, I, we don't routinely um, put them on general anesthesia, but uh, all our staff will be uh, in full PPE. Uh, mm -hmm. including a uh, shot of PAPR uh, sometimes because uh, it really depends uh, on the, I mean, there's no really good evidence that PAPR may, is better, especially if you do not know how to use PAPR very well. And of course, there's also some issues with doffing. I think uh, sometimes you can cross contaminate, I mean, you can still contaminate yourself if you do not do it properly. So for us, it's, uh, we just do it you as a sort of like, do whatever that you are comfortable with and you have always been doing, right? Just that we, now we just have to take extra precautions for, I mean, it's universal. Yeah, it's just uh, for, for all our, our like endoscopy stuff as well as the bronchoscopies, yeah. Do you, uh, uh, I hope that answers your question, yeah. Yeah, is um, uh, Catherine and Dr. Bezzi, is that, uh, does that uh, resonate your opinion too or do you have anything different that you're doing at your centers? I think that's pretty similar to what we're doing here in California at UCLA. Our cancer care for the most part has remained the same. I will say that this has brought about um, increased cognizance of looking for alternative sites to biopsy, just like Dr. Hogarth was mentioning, you know, physical exams, looking for lymph nodes, those types of things, whereas they may have been sort of knee-jerk scheduled for bronchoscopy or CT guided biopsy or whatnot. We have had select cases that we've discussed in tumor board where maybe someone has had an outside hospital CT guided biopsy. They have a PET scan that shows what looks like widespread metastatic disease. They're a little older, they're more frail, they're very worried about COVID. And, and we've just been going on with, you know, a presumptive diagnosis based off of PET scan. That's certainly not our standard. We always preferentially want to get, you know, invasive diagnoses, but in these select cases, given um, the current situation, we have been opting in certain cases to not, you know, move on with a bronchoscopy. Um, you know, I think in general, one of the things that we're wrestling with is how do we start, you know, prioritizing cases as things are going to start opening up again. And, you know, cases where a diagnosis is really going to affect resectability, alternative treatment strategy, looking for molecular mutations that may affect what, you know, immunotherapy they're getting. 
those cases we have still been proceeding with with biopsy either by bronchoscopy or ct guided uh, hi. hello to everyone this is michela betsy from brescia and unfortunately we are one of the three cities which have been hit most in the north of italy and we are also a referral center for interventional bronchoscopy in Italy and in the north of Italy. So actually we haven't changed at all the way we do bronchoscopies for lung cancer staging or diagnosis during these two months. What we have changed is the place where we do that because um, my colleague and I, we prefer to move to, our, to other hospitals like in 200 kilometers from here and to perform bronchoscopies there instead of having the patient being referred in our hospital. And as to our hospital, everything has changed. We are still doing EVOS and rigid bronchoscopies and diagnostic also here, but we are doing more or less between 15 and 20 bronchoscopies diagnostic for COVID-19 every day. We are I think we've performed around 600 bronchoscopies for this diagnostic purpose in the last two months. And the reason is, this is a 2,000 bed hospital. And in less than one week, we have received more than 1,200 patients with COVID. So the problem is putting all of these patients in one hospital, you need you, you don't have enough single rooms. You really need to be sure in the ICU or in other words that the patient has a COVID-19 infection. Even if it's really clear on the CT scan and clinic, whatever, our colleagues really wanted to have a diagnosis, a microbiological diagnosis. And what we do is to perform a bronchoscopy only after at least two or three negative swab. And about 96% of our bronchoscopies were actually positive for COVID-19. So actually, I, I, I see, I've been discussing with all of them for many weeks about the need for this, but that goes up to some legal issues and having more than one patient in the same room together with a positive swab. And that's it. I mean, we, we have to do that. And actually, we, we, we never had any shortage of PPE. We had FF3 uh, masks and all we need for, for the purpose. Uh, so diagnostic is mainly for COVID-19, but we went on with um, cancer diagnosis and staging, the same we did before. And we also moved to, our, to other hospitals in order to reduce the people who come here. Got it. Uh, thank you. That was a valuable opinion. Um, and one of the last things that actually maybe Kyle and uh, Eric, if they're still on, can share your experience. So COVID-19 is not uh, going away completely soon, and it may still um, linger around quite a bit, if not for a long time. Uh, so is there, there was recent, uh, you know, interest that was raised, like maybe we are moving closer to robotic bronchoscopy to um, to decrease our risk, do you think, do you, do you see a different, um, you know, potential for robotic bronchoscopy from now on? Do you think that's uh, that's going to um, be of higher importance now or we need to look at it in a different way before all this happens? That's an interesting I, 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 oh, Somebody else, go ahead, whoever was speaking, go ahead. Sorry, no, no Kyle, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I suppose the, the, the theoretical advantage of, of robotic endoscopy from this perspective is obviously your proximity to the patient can be somewhat removed. Um, and so even if the patient is aerosolizing uh, active COVID, uh, you can obviously with the controller be on the other side of the room and at least obviously have a physical distance. Um, it, but that all being said, there is still the component of setup. There is still the component of, of uh, you know, someone has to obviously be proximal to the patient to arrange uh, either robotic device at the moment. So I, I imagine still uh, it being uh, limited to its current thought process for peripheral bronchoscopy. Um, the, um, I know, you know, at our own institution, we obviously at, at the very beginning shut down essentially all bronchoscopy uh, more or less and obviously nodules and 
peripheral lesions were considered uh, elective uh, in the very beginning. Um, now that we've been essentially shut down for a month, we're, we are actually opening back up. We, we started scoping last week and are ramping things up this week, and that's across all of endoscopy. Um, so interventional GI back open as well. Yes, in a more limited staged approach, uh, we're still obviously moderating anesthesia resources, you know, et cetera. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know. I, we, we did a trial uh, of just some sampling of a of a device that's come out of the GI world to try to minimize aerosolization. It's a um, device called the Piranha. It's made by a GI company where you put it through the biopsy port. So that way you're never suctioning. Now I have no idea, you know, it, we used it once. It seemed to suck fine for what that's worth, but at least the con concept of you're not remotely and uh, uh, aerosolizing there, right? You're pushing it through the biopsy. Port. I don't know if that matters, um, but, uh, Again, maybe in the you know short term, depending on the cost of the thing, does that make someone feel better if they're having to do some active suctioning in a bronch? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so. so let me compliment that. I, I agree with Kyle 100%. I think there's a certain magic of being able to do the procedure from the next room or from a distance, but the reality is you still have to intubate the patient, which is the biggest risk and you still have to uh, do everything else that is required. Um, besides, the robots are not my go-to for every bronchoscopy, as Kyle said, it's just for peripheral nodules. So I'm not sure that I would give them yet a, an advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Harry, I'll, I'll pass on the floor to you. You're close to time or over time. Yeah, and I apologize. I'm going to have to run. Uh, speaking of anesthesia, doing a closed circuit, they just uh, intubated my next case. Who is confirmed COVID negative? <laughs> to the limits of the test. <laughs> Yeah. Be, be uh, safe, everybody. Nice to see everybody. Take care. Nice to see you. Bye bye. We have Dr. Nagarjuna, Dr. Sish, and uh, Dr. Tinku from India. They can share their experiences in brief and then we can close the session. Dr. Tinku? Would you allow a comment from Greece? Of course. Dr. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for the fantastic presentations. It was highly informative and uh, as we may have noticed, Greece is one of the low prevalence countries for the moment because we have implemented early some really extreme measures of social distancing and uh, um, uh, all uh, kinds of uh, limitations to work and uh, about everything about the social habitat. Uh, so we have uh, 2,500 confirmed cases in Greece and about 200 deaths. Uh, the problem is that uh, I wanted to comment on the, on the question whether we are addressing uh, especially lung cancer in the appropriate way. Uh, in Greece, there are many centers that have been turned into COVID centers. The, our main pulmonary centers are only admitting at the moment uh, COVID patients, so there is a high risk of not properly staging lung cancer, and we have this problems. We have noticed that many patients are doing FNA biopsies now because it's very difficult to do a bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopies are delayed, sometimes without any certain cause. So uh, as a working group of interventional pulmonology in Greece, we are trying to formulate our national guidelines. And in my opinion, it is vital to have the proper staging and not to change our current good practice uh, in order to continue treating the lung, especially lung cancer patients in the right way. So we are working on this and all the presentations that I have heard are very helpful in order to especially see if, which patients we will test or not, because we do not have a lot of tests available. It is not possible to test all bronchoscopy patients prior to bronchoscopy. So, of course, we are avoiding cases that are very suspicious. And, uh, of course, we have a lot of pressures from the intensivists in some cases in uh, 
patients with pulmonary opacities, COVID negative, they need a bronchoscopy. We are taking all the necessary measures and we are trying now to put this on paper and uh, try to implement some national guidelines. So uh, at the moment, uh, things are not very clear. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, the test will be implemented for each bronchoscopy. Maybe it will be very difficult for Greece. I sure think that it will be very helpful. We are trying to do this in as much of my case, at least, as possible. But implementing this on the national level, it's much more difficult. Now, regarding staging, uh, we, will we will integrate these instructions into the guidelines, so we will not have make any shortcuts to the diagnosis and staging, especially for lung cancer. So all points from previous presentation will be taken under a lot of consideration, and we will be discussed among all the interventional pulmonologists in Greece. So thank you for your assistance in this, with this teleconference. Thank you. Uh, do we have any experiences uh, to share from India? Dr. Tinku, um, Dr. Nagarjuna Vishweshran, Uh, hello, I'm uh, Dr. Vishweshwaran from uh, India. So one of the suggestions uh, that was given like a bronchoscopy in a suspected COVID that you will do when you don't, when you seriously suspect a COVID infection, but your nasopharyngeal swab comes negative. So in such uh, ventilated patients whom we have a suspicion of COVID, but the nasopharyngeal swab comes negative. Is there any possibility of using the mini ball catheter rather than exposing ourselves to the uh, ball in an ICU where there is a more high chance of uh, getting infected with the aerosol. I just want to know the suggestion how effective a mini ball suction in this case would be as a complementary test for a routine ball in an ICU with an ARDS where the nest of pharyngeal swab comes negative. So it, it's hard to answer your question, obviously, because we're extrapolating from data of bacterial pneumonia. We're extrapolating from influenza. There's a study, uh, uh, multiple studies showing that mini BAL gives you a very good uh, yield for ventilator associated pneumonia, right? So if the patient's already intubated, there's a very good chance that you can get a sample. Now, I wanna throw caution here because obtaining most of the samples is an aerosolizing procedure by itself. So be aware that when they break the circuit to get the mini BAL catheter, they will aerosolize. Um, Kyle mentioned a device that may be able to do it with uh, minimal aerosolization. I think there's no data behind it yet, but but you bring a good, um, a good point, no? That um, can we obtain it with uh, with a blind aspiration? And the answer is, if we extrapolate bacterial pneumonia, the answer would be yes. Okay. One thank you. point I would like to add is that uh, even if your uh, swab is negative, like the nasopharyngeal RT-PCR is negative, uh, try to do all of your, or almost all of the bronchoscopic procedures uh, with necessary PPE because uh, a negative PCR is not suggestive that the patient is not having infection. As you are all are aware that uh, the yield of RT-PCR is close to 63 to 70 percentage. So my uh, advice would be that, that uh, preferably do all the procedures, even if the swab is negative, it should be done with proper PPE. The real concern comes in uh, when we are doing the rigid bronchoscopic procedures, especially most of these procedures are prolonged ones with a potential for transmission of infection. And the major concern is that I would, I'm not sure what is the protocol in different centers across the world, because in my center, what we do is that we wear the proper PPE, but the real problem what happens is that when the air condition has been turned off, there is a lot of congestion and uh, the the, the goggles get uh, fogged up and it's, it's quite difficult to do a rigid bronchoscopic procedure which is lasting for more than an hour in a, in a suit which is with an, without air condition. So uh, is it necessary to turn off the air condition, uh, the, the AC when you're doing a rigid bronchoscopic or any form of bronchoscopic procedure? Um, 
not sure about I think the that if you're cushion. not in a negative pressure room, there's probably some value to not having a positive pressure source at the same time. Uh, whether we can quantitate that or put some data behind that, I, I don't know. Uh, kind of a similar thing to shutting off the ventilator circuit when you're putting the scope in. Uh, I think that, again, we're hypothesizing that we're minimizing the aerosolization during those procedures. Um, and in the case of the air conditioning or positive flow, um, I think it's reasonable if you can tolerate the temperatures that that's going to probably create along with the PPE that you're in, um, you know, which may be an issue. It's, it's extremely difficult to stand uh, with the PPE for one to two hours uh, without air condition. I mean, uh, uh, yep. Presently now in hospital, uh, almost most of the surgeries uh, have been, have been uh, practiced. Uh, uh, they just turn off the AC and uh, because of the potential risk of transmission of infection, uh, not sure regarding this particular protocol which has been followed. Yeah, I think as long as every, so, you know, a lot of these ORs are not negative pressure rooms. Uh, I think if all of your staff is wearing proper PPE um, and that you're waiting at least three hours before you do a final clean of that room, because we know the, the particles can stay aerosolized for three hours. So if you're doing these in a non-negative pressure room, I think if everyone's wearing appropriate PPE, you shouldn't necessarily have to turn off the air conditioning. You just make sure that that room is locked down and does a terminal clean after three hours before it's used again. So my again, question is that, uh, I mean, since it's a centralized system, there is always a potential for transmission of the infection from one OR to the next OR. Because in most yeah, that's of a good point. it will be a centralized air condition system. So there is a potential. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And uh, how about using uh, PAPR for your rigid bronchoscopic procedure? Because I personally feel that most of the prolonged procedures, we should start considering using uh, uh, PAPR devices uh, compared to the N95 or FFP3, because it makes the procedures really comfortable ones. So, uh, uh, Dr. Tinku, so uh, Melvin here. So, um, I've done a few rigid bronchoscopies uh, during this period of time. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I agree that uh, PAPR is uh, a lot more comfortable as in the, you know, uh, especially uh, for longer procedures like what you said, but I don't think, I mean, because resource constraints and, uh, and things like that, uh, you know, not everybody is uh, either have PAPR or trained in PAPR. So, but currently, I mean, of course we think that, you know, uh, PAPR may be better than, the, you know, N95 uh, with, uh, you know, Dr. Usual, uh, Dr. Melvin, I was I was talking about the future because this we are all pretty sure that the virus is going to stay uh, in the world for a pretty long time. So we have to consider about the future, and uh, uh, we have to invest in such resources because we are pretty sure that the the virus is going to last for some time. Yep. So I think for the future, it's uh, like it's going to change our practice. Uh, I mean, it's really change our practice. Like you know, we are taking. We are deciding who we should, uh, who deserve the bronchoscopic procedure in the first place, rather than just you know, uh, you know, openly bronching everybody. Uh, and then of course, uh, like what everyone has mentioned, um, taking all uh, precautions. So I, 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 I'm not sure about, you know, PAPR for everybody. I mean, and so planning for the future that we'll be all wearing PAPR for bronchoscopic procedures is uh, the way to go because uh, you know it's expensive and. Sometimes, uh, you know, certain, certain places just do not have the means to buy them. Yeah, so short of that, I think at least right now, it seems that, you know, our N95 goggles, you know, and then cap and everything else seems to work fairly okay. Yeah, that's just my opinion, yeah. So do we wind up here or we take some more questions? Up to the panel to decide. Can you hear me?
I suspect it's fairly late in India and Singapore. So. Yeah, like, uh, do we have, uh, we have some from Russia as well. Can they share their experiences? Talk to yeah, you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you hear me? So, okay, the situation is uh, mostly, most of our cases for COVID, for coronavirus now are in Moscow. It's around 50,000 patients. And most of them, they're incorporated in the specialized clinics, which were rearranged from the ordinary one. And uh, currently, CD has around two, uh, around, around two, 2,000 patients on ventilators. So the most often indication is just to assist to perform a percutaneous tracheostomy, tr tracheostomy or just making some salvation bronchoscopy at all. Unfortunately, we stopped all the procedures a week, two weeks ago, because we started a complete lockdown for the national healthcare system. And now we got the main problem now. The patients are, uh, the patients are waiting for bronchoscopies. We have a delay in bronchoscopy with all the indications, a part of criticals. So to say the uh, acute airway obstruction or something like this. Uh, from the beginning of the next week, uh, we will start the PCR testing for all patients, uh, which will be referred for bronchoscopy to PCR test. Uh, swabs and uh, one test for immunology. So I don't know really how it will work with the immunology because now we have only data about uh, the efficacy, uh, the, the immune response only for the healthcare workers. Personally, myself was tested yesterday and I had no any antibodies against Corona. And this is, this is not a good news for me. But again, um, I hope that still the, from the next week we will uh, start again performing bronchoscopies for our patients also with tuberculosis and also with uh, lung cancer. So these are the news from Russia. Thank you, Leah. I think um, we can end our discussion here and then say goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.